it and uh, grade one out tip him. <laughs> in fact, uh, that reminded me that when I used to do pellet, you know, um, out pellet studies, and actually if you want to get a good feeling for whether or not there's weasels in your area, go look through owl pellets. Owls are better at sampling those animals than we are, by far. Um, but again, we, we need uh, better methods to be able to monitor these, these uh, smallest carnivores. The least weasel is the smallest carnivore in the world. Their, their energetic demands are off the charts, so they have those, um, uh, I guess, challenges to overcome. They're also, because they are so small, there's so many predators that can prey on them, but also they're limited in terms of what they can take as prey. So you're limited in terms of what you can take because of your size, and you're, because of your size, you're also exposed to more predators. They're exposed to the most of, them, of all of them. And this is the only um, uh, mustelid that um, actually is an urban weasel. That's uh, stone marten. Um, it's not in the U.S., so it's over in Europe. But stone marten. So when we did our urban carnivore book, I really wanted to try and get a weasel in there because I like weasels. The only person that was doing any urban work was a guy over in uh, Luxembourg, and it's a stone marten. And uh, they do actually live in the cities but they haven't stopped being weasels. So they're still weasels, they're still um, mean, they're very mean. And it turns out that the problem with, with stone martens is that they destroy automobiles. So if, you ever, if you're ever curious about it, Google, like there was just a recent article over in Belgium, the insurance rates are just skyrocketing because of stone martens. And uh, there was, um, I think it's in our book, I have to look, but um, the guy who wrote the little, little blurb on that for our book, he discovered the reason why they attack people's cars. It's a very, it was an amazing piece of science that I don't have time to, to describe right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, gotta get, I gotta get the coyotes in so I can finish up. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the coyote um, work. Um, I'm gonna make the argument that they are large carnivores because they do represent risk. They can also, function as an as a apex predator, and not just an apex predator because there aren't any other large predators around. They actually can kill prey larger than them, and they uh, do it um, occasionally or opportunistically, or like over in Nova Scotia, they do it um, uh, because they have to. Uh, so most of the time they're eating small things, but they can eat large things. This is actually a pair of, of uh, coyotes from over in Chicago that killed that doe. That was a perfectly healthy doe, uh, but they pushed her out on the ice and were able to take her down that way. So again, um, they, they meet some of my criteria for large carnivore. Um, so we've been, as Mark mentioned, um, conducting a large scale project for many years, addressing all of these different issues that I'm not gonna have time to go through. Um, I'll just touch on some basic things. Um, so we, we do, live trap our animals, we radio color them, we're interested in how they, I mean the, the project is funded based on conflict. So we wouldn't have any coyote study if it wasn't based on people's fear of coyotes. That's what drove the funding for it. Um, so we needed to radio color them to look at the interactions between them and people. Uh, they were not in the Chicago system to any great degree prior to um, the late 1990s. And that's typical of Midwestern cities um, across the U.S., including here in Ohio. Um, in addition to the adults, then we also go into the dens and we, and we microchip the pups. And so we're able to follow them um, through their daily lives. And we've been able to follow most of the coyotes all the way through from birth to death uh, because of the, the, life, the, the longitudinal aspects of the study. So we're currently, as Mark mentioned, we're a little over, um, I think, 1,400 animals that have been marked so far, and about 600 or so have been radio collared, so it's a large study. And uh, we have caught um, two dogs and two humans that I'm aware of. Now the techs, so there's a couple of previous technicians in here, they may have different numbers on that than I do. I don't know. I just, I, per I saw, I was there for the two humans, so. Um, so this is the aerial image of the Chicago area. These are, uh, this is 570 annual home ranges of 288 
coyotes during that period. I just throw that up there to give you an idea of what the spatial expanse is about 300 square miles that we radio track the animals, including down into the, the core of the city, which is down in the lower right hand corner. Um, so we look at survival rates, causes of mortality, movement patterns, habitat use, especially in relation to people. Uh, one of the things that we found is that survival rates are quite high. Um, that's because food is good and their main cause of death, which is hunting and trapping, is limited in the city. What that means is that because food is good, um, the reproductive rate is relatively high and so is their population growth rate. So the growth rate in, the, in this large metropolitan area is a positive growth rate, which is pretty high, 1.41 lambda. Um, so what that means is that this urban population is a source population, it's not a sink. That was one of the first questions we had in the first year of the study, is, look, is this just a sink where animals go to die? Or are they actually a sustaining urban population? They're not just sustaining Chicago, they're sustaining Milwaukee. For some reason, a lot of our coyotes disperse up to Milwaukee, uh, Kenosha. Don't know exactly why, but um, it's a source population. Moving into the, the core area, was really hard, so we that's what we focus what we've been focusing on in, in the later years. You can kind of get a sense of um, the the increased urbanization by that's a road density map, and so again the downtown area will be over in that lower right hand. And you can notice that the home ranges, the territories are quite a bit larger for the residents living down there. It's a more challenging environment for them. This is a look at some of those territories, and you'll see that there's a lot of a new space. Um, because of um, you know the intense concrete and steel, um, but they are living there and they are reproducing and doing quite well. This is seven, um, Coyote Seven Forty Eight. That's he's actually tending a den on top of a parking garage across from Soldier Field in downtown Chicago. So there's basically no part of Chicago that Coyote can't use. Um, these are the satellite locations of uh, um, Seven Forty Four that uh, no, Four Seventy Seven. So that's an adult female. And that's the Navy Pier jutting out there. That's the loop. Uh, those are skyscrapers where you see those shadows. And uh, she lived there for at least five years that we know of. She outlived her, her battery life of a radio collar. She was the most urban coyote that we have. Within the, the boundaries of her territory lived uh, three quarters of a million people. So that's pretty intense. Um, coexistence to some degree. And obviously she wasn't causing a problem because she didn't um, leave. Um, I got it. Um, so I'll, I'm just gonna show this and, and talk over them a little bit. So this is um, this is a coyote we called Millen Head. Um, he, when he was younger, he had a big head. Um, he was also an alpha male and we um, his mate was also the first coyote we caught. What's significant about him here, he's 12 years old um, in this video. And um, he's a good example of what we're seeing, which is because of the length of the study, we're able to kind of follow these animals all the way through to see if they're changing their behavior in relation to people, especially if you can like not feed them. And uh, he's a good example. So he's actually, this is a, a little pond that's surrounded by a subdivision. And this, to, for the guy to get this, video, this is taken by a videographer for a documentary for PBS. He had this set up in a blind. This is at six o'clock in the morning, just as the sun's coming up, and Melonhead saw him. He's about 60 yards away, and he didn't like it. That's a blind, and this is an animal that lives within a few yards of people. I mean, he did throughout his life. So he never lost his fear. So anyway, so those, we're able to address some of those questions because of the length of this the study, and we're, being, and we're surprised by this. We didn't know that coyotes could live in the city at all. We didn't know they could go downtown. We didn't know that they could live next to people and not cause problems. These are all things, and then we could spend a lot of time learning about how they've made adjustments to their life to be able to avoid the conflicts. These are all new things that we didn't know about. Um, and in fact, that little um, pond is down at the very lower. He's in the purple territory. One of those clusters of points is where that film was taken. Real quick, I'll go through diet and then I'll uh, wrap up. So um, I mentioned the stable isotopes. So one of the big questions we want to know is, are urban coyotes actually functioning as predators? Are they, are they acting ecologically as a predator? Or are they simply living there because we're 
feeding them because they're benefiting from us. And so we went back to the diet. This is the stable isotope work with um, a large sample. This is almost 200 individuals. Each one of those dots represents an individual coyote. We, we collect a whisker and we section the whisker so that we can look at their diet through time. Um, that vertical dashed line represents the anthropogenic line. So individuals that are on the right-hand side have a human-dominated diet. Those that are on the left are natural. Um, and then that yellow area represents individuals that have, they have a diet of over 75% human food. So some of them have the same diet that you have. But it's a small number. Most of them are over on the left-hand side. And what we're really curious about is, is it related, is their diet related to where they live in the city? Especially moving down to the core. Well, and again, it's another surprise. So here we have um, that sample that you just saw broken out based on uh, the place that they were living. These are resident animals, and so they're either in natural fragments, um, like metro parks out in the suburbs. They could be in the suburban matrix, living among uh, the uh, housing developments, or they could be in the urban core. And now we have enough of a sample size, we can actually start addressing that urban core, the, the most urban of the coyotes. And what you'll see is um, those most urban animals span that, that gap. So they're, some of them are eating human food, but a lot of them aren't. A lot of them are still functioning as predators, even in the most heavily developed parts of Chicago. Um, which again was another surprise um, for us. And it's exciting too, because they're still functioning as a predator in that ecosystem. Uh, 748, the guy was on top of the, um, the uh, parking garage across from Soldier Field, he's that le far left-hand dot closest to rabbits. And in fact, that confirmed what we saw when we radio tracked him, we would see him eating rabbits. In fact, he would bring rabbits back to the den. So, um, acting as a real true predator. So another surprise uh, for us. Let's see. Um, and then I'll just show you this. Is, uh, let me see. Um, do you want to see something getting eaten? Um, so we've been talking about predators. So we work with National Geographic. They helped, um, they, their engineer built a critter cam that could work on coyotes. And so we let coyotes do some of the filming for us. So this works. Um, it might not. Um, you want to try? I don't know about this one. So um, the, the camera's going to be underneath the individual, and this is one of those urban core animals. Even though it looks like a, a nature setting behind there, it's actually um, on the edge of a cemetery. You may not be able to get it. All right, that's fine. Um, they'll just speed it up. So um, that was a squirrel. So again, in the most urban core, an example of a coyote consuming a squirrel um, and actually being a predator. We've looked at their impacts on other species as well. I'm not gonna go through these in any great detail. Um, they can be an, um, a, pre um, a carnivore and not just impact prey, but they can also impact other um, intra-guild um, competitors. And so when we radio collared raccoons, skunks, foxes, and feral cats, and these are the most feral cats you can possibly have, so I was a big cat owner for a while. So I had six experimental colonies, and uh, we radio collared all those cats, and we looked to see what impact coyotes would have on them. They had very little mortality on them because these were feral. I mean, these cats were, they were smart. Um, they were street smart. Um, but they knew how to avoid coyotes, so there was super strong avoidance, um, both in terms of the foxes and the cats. Um, so coyotes are having an impact on that, and for the cat work in particular, because cats impact other species, coyotes are actually acting as a protector of green spaces inadvertently by keeping cats out. Um, we've been looking at fawn survival, so uh, we talked about the dangers that these animals have toward people. That's the most dangerous animal So um, here in Ohio. So more people are killed by white-tailed deer than any other single um, wildlife species through deer vehicle collisions. Um, 
So, and especially in cities, it helps to actually have some kind of management going on. What we found is when we uh, looked at fawn survival is that coyotes are the cause of death, the, the primary cause of death, and this is annual uh, survival of fawns um, in a part of Cook County up in Chicago, and you'll see that in many years it's up close to or under 20% that's survival. Um, so, and most of that coyote predation is taking place, these are weeks since birth, so most of the coyote predation is taking place in the first three weeks of birth. So they're having an impact and acting like um, predators in a way that's beneficial to us. Um, I just was going to throw this in as a, we are doing some work with uh, coyotes in Columbus as well as uh, Cleveland with the cooperation or in collaboration with the Cleveland Metro Parks, John Seapack, uh, looking at coyote behavior in different parts of the city. So I'm not going to, okay, this one works. So. <laughs> Uh, so this is the place over here in, in Columbus, so Grayson um, Cahill is the grad student. So this is a novel object, and we're working with other cities to compare um, coyote responses to novel objects in different cities to see whether or not there's differences in, in um, the coyote populations. And um, the early returns is that um, comparing Chicago, Columbus, and Cleveland, there's, there is a difference. Um, for sure. Um, so, one of the questions we're also looking at uh, their personality, um, whether or not um, there's a shift in terms of boldness or aggression, and whether it's a genetic base. So, one of, that's one of our active areas of research. So, it could be that we're changing those animals, and in some cases, they're changing us, which I'll mention in, in just a second. This all ties back into the larger carnivores. So I haven't talked about bears, and we used to have wolves and mountain lions. I wouldn't be surprised if they eventually have, uh, come back to some degree. That's gonna be the big uh, challenge. Um, because there is a massive international um, phenomenon, a kind of an unplanned um, experiment occurring, not just in, in North America, but in other countries as well, which is the largest carnivores are making their way into cities and they're being successful to varying degrees. None of them are going to be as successful as coyotes. I mean, coyotes are the right size and they can they can move into areas and live off of foods that these guys can't. But they share some of the flexibility and some of the, I guess, behaving outside of their envelope that we saw with coyotes. So P22 would be an example of that. So that was an adult male you know, a male lion that lived in LA in Griffith Park. And he had the smallest territory that's ever been documented for a lion, and he lived there for over a decade until they, unfortunately, because of old age, had to euthanize him um, this year, or um, yeah, at the end of last year. Um, brown bears in Romania. This is um, in down, a downtown area. These are brown bears that regularly come in. Um, and in fact, black bears out west actually see, um, are sucked into cities because they're so attractive. Uh, there's so many attractants there. Dingoes over in Australia, uh, leopards in India. Um, I want to mention the leopards in particular. There's a recent paper that just came out. Um, one of the things I haven't talked about yet, I've, I've talked about a little bit with coyotes, and that is the ecological services. So I mentioned that coyotes are removing deer that potentially are a problem for us later. A recent paper came out in, from India looking at leopards in one of the cities there, and what they found is that rabies is a major issue for people there, mainly through feral dogs. The feral dog population in India is off the charts, except where you have leopards. And what they're finding is that they're controlling the dogs, which is also um, reducing the amount of rabies um, cases among humans. Um, hyenas in Ethiopia. Um, these are cases where these animals have moved in. It's not just developing and moving out into their properties. These animals are actually um, finding ways to exploit you know, urban landscapes. And so the question is whether or not that can be done and whether or not people will allow them to do that. So very quickly, so these are the three big ones here. You've all, I'm sure, have seen the distribution maps for them. So um, up the UP of Michigan is probably the closest area um, with wolves to Ohio. Um, there's a lot of discussion in Michigan about whether or when they're going to make that move across into the 
the Lower Peninsula. Um, some of them have been documented there, uh, very few, but um, potentially it will happen. Black bear are already here. Um, there's some, I guess, um, some, I have questions like why have they remained at a low level, but um, at some point um, they're gonna become more established in the state. And of course, then they have mountain lions. So the wolf populations in, in Wisconsin, we're getting wolves coming down towards Chicago. I wouldn't say regularly, but it's actually not uncommon. So we just had one a couple months ago. Um, so that's happening. And again, that's the, the population trend for the UP. This map was published by Laura Cruz Lab in a paper that just uh, that came out a couple of, well, actually in 2016. So this is the historic range of mountain lions. The red dots represent dispersals. You'll notice there's actually a red dot in Chicago. So there was a mountain lion that made its way down toward Wrigleyville um, and lived there for a little while in someone's yard until it got shot. But um, the green spaces was represents their modeling where they identify suitable habitat for resident uh, mountain lions. You'll notice that there is a little patch there for Ohio. The, the lighter green is uh, dispersal areas. The other part of that paper that was interesting is that they did a socioeconomic analysis. And what they found is that if mountain lions were able to establish themselves in that area, so resident lions in the dark green, transients in the light green, they would have a socioeconomic benefit of reducing so many deer auto collisions and saving um, hundreds of lives annually. Um, so uh, it was a really interesting, I guess, uh, piece of work. So there are benefits that we haven't really thought about um, in addition to the risk that these animals pose. So real quick, so coyotes are residents uh, throughout Chicago and other um, cities, including here in Ohio. Uh, they represent the largest carnivore that we have that can actually, that we've been able to document penetrating the urban core and not just moving through it, but actually um, being successful in exploiting it, raising litters, um, and everything else. We also have documented that they do continue functioning as predators in the system, so they're not just turning into uh, dumpster divers, um, unlike raccoons, for example. Raccoons um, quickly convert but uh, rat, uh, coyotes have some resistance to that. Um, and the nice thing about this is that there's been re relatively little risk. So there is some, I guess, changes in their behavior as well as changes in human behavior. Now the changes in human behavior was not necessarily elective. So people didn't want coyotes there. Uh, they wanted to get rid of them, but they couldn't. And so now they're trying to learn how to, to live with them. So there's actually human behavior um, getting adjusted in, in terms of monitoring their trash and things like that in their pets. So coyotes do illustrate how carnivores, so the, the take home message that we learned, we underestimated their ability to be flexible, we underestimated their ability to exploit places close to us. What we're finding with these larger carnivores is that there are other traits um, that are also flexible as well. And so there's possibilities that there could be more coexistence that takes place in a human-dominated environment for some of these carnivores than what we would currently think. That's kind of the take home. We didn't think that coyotes could do the things that they are doing, and especially be able to live among people um, without causing a lot of problems. Um, um, and this, so an area that where we need to continue to do our work is um, look at what kind of ecosystem services or ways that they benefit us. So our project is pretty typical of mammalian carnivore research projects in which, again, it's still funded, even after 22 years, it's funded based off of conflict. It's funded based off of trying to minimize risk. No one ever pays to learn what kind of um, ecological benefits coyotes might um, serve. And that's uh, true for a lot of the other carnivores as well. So, um, so that part of their portfolio is completely um, underrepresented. So um, we're kind of in this new epic. We're kind of experiencing this uh, new unplanned experiment, both in terms of our own uh, benefits and our own um, actions, as well as those of the animals that we're, we're sharing space with. So we'll see just how this group of carnivores can actually um, live with us as we move along. 
And if I have just one more minute, so this is another one of those. Oh shoot, it won't work. <laughs> so, say time. Um, so this is my reminder. So this is that. Um, yeah. So if anyone's curious about it, I think we have this on YouTube. But this is another critter cam on an animal, one of our coyotes eating a diet item, a prey item that's never been described before. So it's too bad you can't see it. I <laughs> just see. Yeah, I don't know. So it seems like it's a critter cam stuff. Um, so it's, I leave it, I put it in there as a reminder to me that, you know, when I showed you those maps of diets and that type of thing, so that's how we analyze their data, we have to have some idea in terms of what their, what their diet items actually are. This particular animal doesn't show up in any documented case of coyote populations at all. So we wouldn't have known that if we didn't have a video camera stuck underneath that animal's chin. And so it's just a reminder to me of humility, if nothing else, is that this animal will eat nothing but that one animal all night. All night, that one animal, that one type, not one animal, that, that species, that one species all night. And um, we wouldn't know if we didn't have the technology. And that's, that's just a, the tip of the iceberg of what we don't know about a lot of these animals and how they function in these urban, urban systems. So, Abby, you know what it is, right? But it, yeah. Uh, rainy night in an ag field, and it was earthworms. Earthworms. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, yeah. I'll shoot yeah. this one actually. So this is the critter cam. Sorry, I should have just shut up. This is not the earthworm. Um, so this is actually going to show you which of those mesocarnivores actually is the dominant species of them all. So this is again, you can see the chin of the coyote. The coyote is cautiously coming up to where that very, very fearsome mesocarnivore is. See his paw? Yeah. But you have to watch close because this, this animal is very secretive. But it runs the roost. It is dominant over coyotes, it's dominant over everything. He's scared. He's really scared now. This way, up, you saw it here. He's Did you see it? He saw it. And now he's going. He escaped. Did you see what it was? Badger. The stripe's gone. It's gone. Yeah. Oh. All right, uh, that's all. I ran over. Sorry about that.